Hello, and welcome to Chit Chat Live. This week, we have a special guest with us, Josh Taylor. Thanks for joining us, Josh. Hey, a pleasure to be here. Great. We are very excited to have you on the show this evening, joining um, Terry and Jen and I. And um, for those of you who are used to our format, where we talk about all sorts of genealogy programming, today we get to have our very own insider, sort of. Hopefully he can give us some insights. Um, <laughs> and we, we greatly appreciate you being here and taking time out of your busy schedule. And, you know, I, I just have to start off by asking, do you ever really sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, I do. I, I sleep when, when we're not researching and not filming and, <laughs> and all of that. But no, I, I do sleep. It's something, actually, one of my resolutions in 2015 was to sleep a little bit more. <laughs> I'm, it's a good I'm, resolution to have. I'm, I'm completely good with that one, too, because I just am amazed that you're always on the go and you're always somewhere. You're always doing something. Yeah, yeah. I, I try and do power napping, but now I'm trying to get, you know, at least six hours a night. That's my goal. Wow. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> so, wow. um, so I know um, you've been on a, a lot of different shows in the past, and we're very excited to uh, have seen you again on Genealogy Roadshow. It was such a good season. Um, you know, I, I have a question about the research, and I know you've alluded to this in some of the other interviews I've seen with you, but how much actual hands-on research do you get to do for the programming or are you relying on a team or? So it actually, it was very different between season one and season two. Uh, this season, they actually let us get our hands dirty in the research from the very beginning. So we had a research team behind us. And one of the roles that sort of Kenyatta, Mary and I took on this season was serving as sort of research captains in that end. Mm -hmm. And so we would, you know, go through the cases and say, okay, Mary would be great to lead this case. You know, this is a case for Josh. This is a case for Kenyatta. And so while a lot of the sort of groundwork on research is done by a research team, we are with them on an almost daily basis online, sort of communicating back and forth. Wow. And in some of the cases, we did sort of completely from scratch on our own because we just couldn't let it go <laughs> and wanted to totally <laughs> touch those. And then at the end, you know, we sometimes are doing research right up until filming just to put sort of a final look on the research. Wow. That seems, wow, that's a lot. But it's, it's exciting, at least to me. I don't know if the other ladies want to chime in here too, but to be able to pick and choose like that must be a real nicety. <laughs> <laughs> a, a nice change. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. I mean, we, you know, the production company, of course, has the final say over, you know, what research we're going to be doing and what directions we take. And there's nothing worse than having the one case that you've worked on for hours and hours get cut. <laughs> I'm already going, okay. Well, I mean, that, that absolutely happened on, on more than one occasion, but it was really nice to, to not only be on TV, but also be doing what you love behind the scenes and helping stories get written and, and helping with the research behind that process. That's awesome. So, Terry, did you have a, a burning question? Actually, I do. I was just going to ask. Um, so, <laughs> you, you talked a little bit about doing the research behind the scenes as well, but walk us like, kind of like through the process. If we were to submit... Are you looking at those submissions or is it the casting that does that beforehand and then gives you, you know, let's say 50 out of 100? So it's a great question, you know, and, and I can't share too much of the process, but what I can share is there is a casting department that looks at the first level submissions and, mm -hmm. you know, they go through and might do a summary sheet for us of different stories that are out there. And then from there, we will add in, you know, thoughts about, story that we've never talked about before or this one it's going to take six years of research we can't <laughs> and and sometimes we we sort of have a little back and forth where well you say it's going to take six years why don't you tr start on it and see where you get mm -hmm. and you know some cases you're actually pleasantly surprised and in others it's like yeah this this is a six-year project <laughs> not going to happen overnight and, and from there, literally, it just depends on sort of how the show, that, that episode's coming together, if things work out right with the guests, because you have, you know, all sorts of personal things you have to handle in, in that end, you know, can they be there that day for filming, what kind of family can attend, 
And, and then there's also the production company is thinking about what kind of stories are we telling? You know, you can't tell the same story over and over and over again. Right. So they're controlling it from that end as far as making sure that it remains exciting and sort of cutting edge. So with your research team and you're researching, um, let's say, a certain story, is the same research team doing the history of, let's say, where you are or um, the history of that time period? Or is that a whole different ball of wax? That, that's all handled by, by someone else. So that's all okay. part of the production team. In fact, even you'll notice sometimes in a segment where we sort of cut away to what we call a history package. Mm-hmm. That's usually all done sort of independently. We might, we might advise on that research or give some sources that we've used because naturally we run into some of the information as we do the family history portion of it. But those are sort of history packages that are produced sometimes after we've actually done the filming. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I wondered about that. I have a question for you. Uh, so I see all these wonderful things that you're showing on your iPad. What app are you guys using? <laughs> My husband wants to know. <laughs> that is, you know, that is the number one question that I oh, get really? every episode. And we use an app. It's called Moodboard. Oh. Hmm. And it allows you to create sort of little boards for each story. So every story has its own mood board, and you can arrange the documents and sort of zoom them in and zoom them out on the screen. Cool. We can do that with an Apple TV. That is not one of the programs my husband thought it was. <laughs> he has a list of five potential ones, and he's like, you have to ask that question. I want to know. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it is it is mood board. And I I mean, I think I should work for them some days by all, all the people that love mood board. And, and I, I mean, I love it because it's a really, really great way to sort of engage the guests with the documents. And, you know, we can everybody has their own way of setting it up. You know, I like to sort of cluster my documents together in different sections of the story. And I think Kenyatta likes to lay them out sort of very orderly. <laughs> no, we don't organize them differently. She seems like a very organized and orderly lady. <laughs> she's the lawyer. No, she's the lawyer. And she, oh, will, yeah. she will lower her glasses and tell you like it is. And it's like, okay. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I can see that. I can really That's funny. see that. So, so for people who know me, and um, I, I have to tell you that um, I, when I was at FGS Roots Tech, we went to the opening night and got mm-hmm. to see the behind the scenes video and, do, and listen to the panel and everything. Um, the next day when I was talking to my boys on the phone, they were so upset that I didn't tell them that there was this panel and that you were going to be there because they watch who do you think you are and genealogy road show and finding your roots and all those shows with me and they go to the library and do research and stuff and so you've kind of become their like hey he's a young guy he's my idol type of person just so you know Uh-oh. no, no pressure <laughs> <laughs> but they you're relatable you're not a girl <laughs> you're a young gentleman and um and they can relate to you because you're not their mother but um, they just thought that that was so neat. And so my, my oldest boy wanted to know if you had a favorite um, story, especially dealing with a military aspect. Hmm. Um, favorite military story. Um, you know, it, it would actually probably be the Who Do You Think You Are episode with Rob Lowe. Hmm. Where, yeah, you know, was he, he was looking for a connection to to Washington and the Revolutionary War, and it, it, it was it's really interesting to watch someone who has such a passion for history, mm-hmm. and you know you, you you see folks on on TV and you think oh yeah 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 you know that, that's just <laughs> that's just what they are on TV, but no, I mean someone who literally was so into this topic that you know when when he learned the you know Hessian soldier, I know exactly what that is, <laughs> you know, and, and, and wait a second. <laughs> That's bad. <laughs> that's, that's not what I was looking for. And, and so that, that was a really cool moment because you, you know, it's, it's a way where people sort of have hobbies or interests in their lifetime that no one else sees. And then they start to investigate their ancestry and they find a connection. Mm-hmm. So that was probably a, a favorite military moment. Absolutely. Okay. So that was from the 14 year old. So the eight year old who, who is actually <laughs> standing over there waving (laughs) he wanted me to ask you 
and will actually ask the panel. And you're probably not going to be able to give him the answer he wants to know. But he wants to know when you're going to have a story or a star on a future show that he knows. <laughs> That's good. Uh, like from Disney Channel. <laughs> you know what? I, I I would say that one's all up to a production team. <laughs> Talk about engaging your youth. Yeah, I know. He Never, gave me the thumbs know. up as he went back to eat his pizza. So <laughs> good boy. Well, can't you watch who do you think you are in America Forever this year? Doesn't he know who she is? You know, I don't know if he does. Because he was thinking, like, it, it wasn't necessarily who do you think you are, but, you know, sometimes he, when we watch Genealogy Roadshow and you talk about a significant historical event, he yeah. will, on occasion, he's in second grade, you know, he does have <laughs> weird parents, so we inform him of a lot of odd facts, but he doesn't know everything. So I like to take that opportunity for those shows to pause it, because usually I have to DVR it and then show it to them later. Mm -hmm. And we'll have a discussion about the history or the event or, you know, what they were discussing, that person's family tree or the record. And a lot of the times he's like, that's neat. Will I learn more about it later? Yeah, that's fine. And it's just, I think occasionally he's like, I'd really like to know something before the show starts. (laughs) (laughs) And and I keep telling him it comes with time, sweetheart. (laughs) It comes with time. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Aw. That's cute. Yeah, well, they tried. <laughs> yeah, there is one thing I, I love about the show is actually the opportunity to talk about sort of unique events in history that, you know, might get glossed over in a history book. Right. We sort of can dive into a little bit deeper on the show. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I like it from the learning opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah. I really enjoyed the field trips that you guys took in the first couple yeah. episodes. Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 those were, were really fun. I mean, to, you know, to sort of have a camera following you through a cemetery. It's, it's, it's <laughs> I'm sure it was. <laughs> but it was, but it was uh, neat, especially when you went to um, the one in New England, the, um, I can see the pictures in my head. The American Antiquarian Society. Yes. Yeah, that- Yes. Yes. That was just fascinating watching you go through the, the repository and seeing the, the, the books and the records and where everything was. And I liked how either I'm assuming it was you who wrote the script for that pointed out that you should ask the local archivists and, his, and uh, librarians because they know their collections best. And I couldn't agree more with that statement. Oh, yeah. yeah it, actually, with the, you know, it's, with the scripts on those, they sort of asked us, well, where do you want to go? Where are, your, where are your key collections? And then what are the key things to ask at these repositories? You know, what should we take away? And it, it was a great opportunity to sort of have some impact on the script and how it would go, but, but also let people know that, hey, this isn't as easy as you see it on TV. <laughs> There's a lot of the work that goes into it. Yes. <laughs> Very true. That's awesome. Jen, do you have a burning question? A burning question. Yes, Josh, I have a burning question. Oh, no. How did you can handle all your travel and eating out and not lose your mind? <laughs> <laughs> because Roost Tech just was just one week, and I was, you know, I was exhausted. And we ate out a lot, and, you know, by the end of the week, I was just, you know, very grateful to get to go home. How do you handle that with traveling almost every weekend? It seems like with some of your talks. You know, I um, I I did a, a whole sort of diet fitness routine during filming last last year, and part of that included always going to a grocery store when I go into a city, not necessarily eating out. Um, except when I was in Chicago, I had deep dish pizza twice. I was just I was just there with. Why? <laughs> well, you know, I had to go to the airport. I had to have dinner. Um, <laughs> But other than that, you know, I, I really would try and, and go to a, a grocery store and keep up my same sort of routine. And, you know, when, when people, we go out to eat in groups and stuff, I, I do try and keep on the lighter side because nothing is worse for me when you're traveling and you you just had a really, really heavy meal and you're trying to sleep and you're in a different bed. And so, so a lot of that was, you know, keeping up with the routine. But also, I mean, it's so nice when you travel as part of a TV production, they sort of take care of your travel. They're making sure your hotel's okay. And so there's a whole support team behind you. 
in, you know, maybe she would get from point A to point B and do you need a yogurt, do you need a banana, I'll I'll get you a banana. And and that's (laughs) because sometimes when you finish a shoot, all you want is like a banana or a chai (laughs) or whatever. Yeah. They're they're really, really helpful in in that and making sure that you're truly taken care of. We need an entourage for the future. You write yes, it down. we need a support team. <laughs> Add that to the wish list. That's right. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I you know we should just bring people to come to conferences and just sort of go for running for errands for people to get fruit and veggies and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> would be That'd nice. be awesome. <laughs> I can see a market here. Hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You can put an IGG sticker right next to the Chiquita banana sticker. That's right. <laughs> and so it begins. Oh, no, don't say that. <laughs> I, yeah. Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so you're also uh, president of FGS. Yes, yes. Which is very exciting in of itself. And your term is almost up, isn't it? Um, my, my first two years were up in December and I re up for two more years. So oh. I, I will turn okay. out in December of 2016. Okay. Wow. So you're halfway through. Halfway through. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you have to look on the positive side of things on occasion, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's hard because, you know, there's so much that I want to do with the organization and mm-hmm. so much potential there and so much that we're doing already. And I, I knew in the outset that four years wouldn't be enough. You know, two years wouldn't be enough. Mm-hmm. But there's you know, there's good things happening in the organization every day. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. cool. I have a question for you related to societies. Yeah. So uh, I recently took on a role as uh, a trustee for the Ohio Genealogical Society. And one of my jobs is to kind of help support some of the local chapters. And one of the chapters that uh, I visited is having a really hard time trying to find members that are willing to take on leadership roles. Mm. And, you know, I think part of it is that it's a lot of older people in the group. And I don't see a lot of new people coming in. So I'm just kind of curious what what you would recommend as kind of a, you know, approach to, to helping them. You know, it really is a difficult one. And I'll be you know, very honest that even FGS suffers from that at times. You know, oh, sure. it's hard to get people other than the standard five or six people <laughs> to take on a, a new role. Yeah. And, you know, a, a lot of that is looking at the roles that are sort of open, the leaders that they need. It's prioritizing what's the most essential thing for the organization right now. You know, it, it, it's okay in many ways for an organization to not have a parliamentarian for six months if they can't have someone to fill that role. Yeah. You no, know, I mean, it's, I mean, we'd like to have all the roles filled, but what's essential for the organization to continue? And maybe the most important role to fill is a volunteer coordinator who's passionate about getting new people involved, who literally devotes all of their time to getting new leaders involved rather than trying to fill 10 positions, fill that one position with the right person. Mm-hmm. And use their skills and the skills of the existing board to then backfill some of those other roles. Oh, great. I really appreciate that. That's, that's an excellent idea. I have to say, um, I've been a member of several um, not-for-profits, and, I, and unfortunately, I don't think it's a specifically genealogical-based. I think it's oh, endemic no. across all volunteer organizations. You never have enough help, and it's always so hard to get people. And then when you get a good person, it's like the group puts their claws in them and it's like, don't leave me ever. Yeah. And then eventually you have burnout, you know? Exactly. And and, and we, we so often organizations, we tag the same person for multiple duties. Mm -hmm. And, and usually, you know, most of those who are, you know, go getters will accept four or five roles and then get burned down two or three of them. And it's, it's so hard because, you have to make a decision of would I rather have that role filled or have it filled by someone who's going to burn out in this time period. And it's, it's so hard. It's a very delicate balance. I know nothing about okay. this. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm yeah. I, to- I had to learn to say no. It was a very difficult thing. I was very involved in a lot of my engineering societies, which are all, you know, primarily men 
and, you know, oh, a girl who wants to be involved, <laughs> you know, they just keep nominating me for more positions. And, you know, finally I was like, you know, I'm going to pick one organization to be a part of. And so I kind of took a step back from some of the others and, you know, I felt like I could do a better job by focusing on the one society that I was involved with. So. Yeah, that's actually one of my, another one of my resolutions for the year was to start saying no more than I say yes. <laughs> because it, it's hard because you, you know, you want to do so many things and, and you can't do it. And it, it's actually where, you know, you realize as a volunteer, you're actually doing more damage to the organization than you are, you know, positively by just accepting a role and not being able to do it or, you know, doing it, but then letting it take away from other organizations so knowing to say no is, is an important thing and a lesson I'm still working to learn. <laughs> it's, um, it, it is a very hard one. And I have to say, I've been involved in one group for over 20 years. And it took me at least a good 15 <laughs> to learn how to say no effectively. <laughs> because people would say, you don't really mean it. And, and come back anyways. And eventually uh -huh. I would cave. You know, and, and I was doing three and four positions or I was volunteering to to cook a, a dinner or I was making a flyer or I was doing this or I was doing that. And I would stay up and kill myself because I am one of these I'm not going to let someone down type of people. Yeah. And it got to the point where I eventually woke up one day and realized I need to teach other people what I'm doing. And sometimes, and I actually said this to some of the members of my local society who were the founding members of the group who are complaining, well, we have new members, but they're not doing anything. And I finally looked at one of them. I said, it's because you have all the jobs. Mm -hmm. Well, how mm -hmm. do I know they're going to do the job? Well, why don't you teach them? Why don't you have a deputy or an assistant? And I'm sure somebody would be more than happy to help you. And it might come down to that too, Jen. That's true. I will have to mention that to her. <laughs> Terry's awfully quiet. <laughs> oh, I'm wondering if she has a story. going to my head. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about this, the same issues here, you know, in Chicago with different societies. You know, they want the help, but then when you volunteer, oh, so-and-so who's been doing it for 10 years doesn't want to give it up now, but Originally, she was walking away mm -hmm. and, you know, and they're still looking for people to volunteer and everybody just kind of laughs at this point because, you know, all the volunteers were there. You just were afraid to teach them, you know, so I've, I've cut it down to just my local society and I really enjoy um, the time that I put in with them. Good. Made life easier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it does. <laughs> yeah so we have so. about 10 minutes left and there's one topic um that we've talked about significantly and that we wanted to get your take on too josh was it, as a public figure in the genealogy world um sometimes there's negativity that comes across especially through social media or people who don't understand something or rumor mills get started and I was wondering, well, we all were actually wondering, how exactly do you deal with, you know, the negativity that can come through, especially if it's, you know, a production issue that you don't have anything to do with, or um, maybe just give us some advice. <laughs> um, you know, it, it's, it's something that I will admit I, I struggle with. Um, the advice that I was given by, by others sort of from the production company in that is, you know, with anything you do, a third of the people are going to love what you do. A third are really not going to care and a third are going to just hate it and think they could do it better. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because you, you can't change someone's opinion. And there are so many things that are outside of, of your control. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I stopped Googling my. And on messages all day long, and that's what they do. And you'll never stop them. <laughs> you know, you'll, you'll never, I mean, it, it, sometimes engaging them in a conversation is the worst thing you can do because if they're already set in their opinion, you're not going to change it. All you're doing is adding more fuel to the fire. 
And so for me, I, I really try and stay positive and focus on, you know, the mission of, of a, a show about family history. It's not for the genealogists. It's not for us as a community in, in that sense. It's for a broader audience. And, you know, keep in mind that every time you express displeasure with a family history show on TV, whether it be Finding a Roots, Roadshow, Who You Think You Are, you know, anything, you're potentially hurting the chances of your field and your your passion having an, and finding a wider audience. You know, the, the more negative we are about the opportunities we have to expand family history to others, it, it can hurt us. And I'm, I've always felt that one of the things that I really want to do, you know, if I were to list the three things I want to do in my life, one of the, the biggest ones is to bring family history to a much larger audience and to let people know the value of it and how important it is for everyone. And so I, I focus on that, you know, and if, I mean, mistakes happen all the time. Everybody makes mistakes. You can screw up a date. You can screw up something, you know, here and there. It could be your fault. It could be someone else's fault. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. It was a mistake. It happened and you move forward. If you focus on it, then that's all it's ever going to be is sort of this mistake that swirls and, and keeps you up at night and keeps the community talking. And so really, I, I always look forward and, and have to ground myself in the, the larger sort of idea, and that is that I want to be able to have everyone in the world know what family history is and why it's important. And that's sort of my, you know, that's how I put myself to sleep at night when things happen. I think that's awesome, and a lot of people can learn from that, because I will tell you, on the other end, because we sit down and we talk about these shows every week, we're out there reading these things, and I have engaged once too often um, with people who are just bashing the show for whatever reason. And I, you know, and I always think, but you're not their target market. Mm -hmm. We need to be happy. It's on watch it. Don't watch it, but at least let it play on your TV. <laughs> Keep the <rating> <laughs> um, but literally just, um, you know, just be happy that it's out there and they're engaging all these other people that it's meant for. It's not meant for us. Um, so I give you a lot of credit for being able to not look because <laughs> <laughs> I find it really hard to walk away. And there were days where I, you know, was just in argument after argument with people because basically they're upset because, you know, one of the shows won't talk to them and they feel that they're the experts in like whatever area it may be, you know, <laughs> Walk away. Just walk away. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, and, and there's also, you know, there is such a, and, and, and part of it is that, you know, family history never, I think, really expected to meet television. But the process behind creating the TV show, I had no idea what it was like. I mean, you have you know, literally hundreds of people involved at multiple levels. And when you're, when you're sort of bashing their work, you know, you're not just bashing a show, you're bashing someone's livelihood. And, you know, someone who took so long to set up a shot so the lighting was just right so it came through the window and there's a date that got flipped on the side <laughs> and you're complaining about the date and they're going, but look at this beautiful shot. <laughs> and, you know, and I look back and I go, yeah, that's a really, really cool shot. <laughs> like, you gotta admit that. And so it is, it's, it's just one element to a much larger piece of production and and if anything you know i have such a respect for those in the production company that if if the time comes i'll absolutely defend them in things because they they care enough about family history to make it look cool and make it look exciting and that means a lot to me the artist in me appreciates that <laughs> <laughs> you can't help it well, ladies, do any of you have one last comment, question, topic before we close I the evening? Have, uh, I have a question. If you can give any advice to a new genealogy professional, what would it be? Network. I mean, network, network. You, you, you don't have to build sort of very you know, firm everyday communications with people. But knowing who the specialist is in Anchorage, Alaska, when you find that case you're working on that takes you to Alaska, even if it was a text you made two years ago, you'll never, ever regret it. I mean, network, network, network. Get, get to know people. Know who they are, what organizations they're connected to. You, know, you can't sit in isolation and be successful as a professional anymore. You have to network. So good one. I agree. <laughs> Very true. Well, I think we agree because it's worked so well for us. <laughs> but, you know, un unfortunately, I think a lot of people are afraid to. 
do you do you think that 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 I don't know if it's the field or or the type of people who are drawn to this field, but there are a lot of genealogists, especially um, maybe newer ones, who are just scared and intimidated, and um, or just plain shy. <laughs> So yeah, yeah. I, but, I, but I I agree. Networking, they're going to have to get out that comfort, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, and, and this is why you know providing different avenues to network. I think we need more of them in the industry. You know, it can't. Not everyone's going to fit into a conference model or a social media model. Mm -hmm. uh, there's got to be other ways for professionals to network that help, help someone who's very shy and doesn't want to walk into a group of thirty people. You know, how, how can they reach out to someone? There's got to be more avenues for that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm good with that. <laughs> about that one. It's definitely wrong to think on like how to do that. Yeah. Yeah, because I would think, you know, when I started in family history, I got involved with the US Genma project. Mm -hmm. And the reason why I did that is because no one knew how old I was. And I, you know, I mean, I mean I was just an email address who was creating websites. And and that overcame the fear I had of the ageism that exists in, in the field. Right. And, you know, and it worked. And, and then once people found out how old I was, then it wasn't as big a deal because I already had a, a track record, at least, of volunteering and working in organizations. But, yeah, I mean, I mean, there were organizations that wouldn't have anything to do with me because I was too young to, to want to do family history. And you know, so it's just, but I do think we need to create more avenues for incoming professionals to network and to learn from others. Heck, I started much later than you did. <laughs> and I got that you're too young to be here. On <laughs> yeah. <and> so <laughs> I applaud you for hiding behind an email address and tell people <laughs> got to know your skills. I mean, it, 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 was, it was the way it was. It's true though, because I still get that at some of the local places here when I talk about it. They're like, really, what do you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You know, it's, sometimes it's hard to be polite. <laughs> covering the gray and let it show. <laughs> and then it won't be as bad. <laughs> Sorry. I, I should laugh at that, but it's too funny. <laughs> well, it's horrible, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't think that I was, you know, still in my 20s. Come on, give me a break. <laughs> Someone actually asked me one time if my oldest child was my baby brother. And while that kind of made me feel good, <laughs> because I obviously have good genes, it kind of went, ew, no, 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 no. <laughs> I took my oldest out, this was quite a few years back. She was, I think, maybe a senior in high school. We went to the museum for the day. And we were going into one of the, you know, you needed a ticket to get into whatever the special section was. And the uh, young kid said, oh, it's so nice to see sisters out. And I was like, dude, it's my daughter. <laughs> So my mom and I often got mistaken as sisters. I remember my freshman year uh, orientation for high school. My mom came with me and we're sitting in this classroom and uh, the teacher turns to my mom and and asks, you know, oh, well, uh, are you are you guys, you know, sisters or what's the story here? And my mom just like cracked up and she was like, Thank you so much. Oh <laughs> Just like, I'm her mother. <laughs> I just wanted to point out that it took us over 30 minutes to get deep off topic. So that's a new record. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty good. Yeah, usually it's five and we're off track. So, <laughs> you know, it's all right. Oh, well. Okay. Well, it's been a little over half an hour, which means our time is up this evening, which is so sad. We could probably keep going on for another hour, at least, I would think. <laughs> but unfortunately, we all have other things that we have to do in our life. Um, thank you again, Josh, for coming and talking to us and humoring us on a little bit <laughs> with some of our questions. We greatly appreciate it. Oh, you're more than welcome. Happy to be here. And everyone out there in YouTube land, thank you for watching. We look forward to hearing from you. Please don't forget to stop by our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, or even leave us a comment here below. We really love your feedback and love hearing from all of you out there. Don't forget to go out to our website, www.theindepthgenealogist.com. And on that note, have a good week, everyone. We'll see you next time.